people are cruel and they don't care. Mm. And she's just having to figure it out and also watch people not care that she's gone and realize she didn't really make an impact. I'm obsessed with school spirit so far. I need to find out what happened to Maddie. Uh, so I appreciate oh, you taking the time. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so right off the bat, you know, we've got Maddie in the afterlife trying to figure out what happened to her. Peyton, can you tease a little bit of the journey that she's going to go on? Insane what a journey it is considering it's all in a high school. Um, yeah. But she's stuck in this purgatory and she just has to witness everyone else moving on after she's died and she hasn't moved on and it's you know people are cruel and they don't care mm. and she's just having to figure it out and also watch people not care that she's gone and realize she didn't really make an impact mm. <laughs> oh, that's so mm. sad that is sad i mean sarah and nick you guys are both on the other side you're in the afterlife, you're in the support group with Maddie. Tell me a little bit about the dynamic that's going on in the afterlife and, and how they influence Maddie on her search for the truth. Yeah, well, it's interesting because we are on the other side of it. Um, so we're less concerned about, you know, the who done it of it all. We want to help Maddie as, and that is part of her journey. So then we do help her with that. But at first, initially, we're like, this is where you're at. Like, this is how it works. This is what we do here. And we also are totally on our own. Our own journeys of kind of how we've sort of coped with being stuck there. And I've been there 60 years and you've been there, what? 27. 27 years. And, you know, I've been there so long. I'm like, I don't actually care about finding out, like figuring anything out. I am stuck. And I've just accepted that as my lot in afterlife. Yeah. And you have a more optimistic take, I think on it. Yeah. But, um, we're definitely not at first involved or I'm definitely not concerned with figuring out how this little one died. I'm like, welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah. um, like, Literally, I don't care. You do say that. Yeah, I do say it. <laughs> I do say that. Mm -hmm. sure. Well, and tell me a little bit about those afterlife support group scenes, because Milo said that they were like the most fun parts to film. Those were so fun. Which you wouldn't think. You would not think that those were the most fun scenes. And when we would do those scenes, the almost like the whole day would would be those well, scenes. Well, we shot them all in like four, like the first two episodes, we shot those those scenes in like three or four days, just back to back. Yeah, so it was like the whole day we knew we'd get to be in the circle. And then some of the scenes like are a little bit heavier, some are just really funny. Mm -hmm. um, For me, I still care about knowing what happened to me and, um, and Maddie's coming in with different energy, coming from different places all the time, trying to figure these things out. So sometimes I would have to separate because I would have way too much fun yeah. if I was in the room with them. And like, there's just yeah. so much joy in that room that I would have to walk away and separate because we all were in such different places. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, those, yeah, were, Maddie, those were really fun. Too fun. Yeah. Maddie's coming in with revelations that, you know, we'll get into later in the season and, and there's discussions about donuts. Uh, how yeah. was it? playing off of each other in those moments where you were all coming at each other from a very different perspective, but all dealing with the same thing. It was, I mean, um, yeah, too much fun. Sometimes too much. We <laughs> ruined takes often by the end um, because we were laughing too hard. So I had to try to not laugh and that was hard. They gave us a lot of liberties as well. Um, with uh if we wanted to add a line here or there or a button or improv or something and then there were a couple of times specifically in that donut eating scene where we um we went we, we went long. a little too long yeah. and they were like they okay, cut it, just, which is fine yeah they were like okay just for time let's try one where we just end the scene where it, it's supposed to <laughs> we were like and then the line ends there and then we do 10 minutes back we and forth added a fight yeah we did it was good though <laughs> with with milo they would just the improv and make the scene something completely different yeah and max was like and how about we cut that you yeah, know, yeah, whoever, yeah. and none of that. <laughs> we release the extended cut. That's what I say. That's, <laughs> we release we're trying, it. We're try, that's we want we, the yes. bloopers. There yeah. was a scene we ruined, and I want to see those bloopers. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> right off the bat, I would love both of you to tell me just a little bit about your characters. We've got Maddie's allies on the living side. Uh, Christian, if you want to go first. Yeah, I would say, um, so I play Simon Elroy, <laughs> and I sort of see him as a bullet. He's very <laughs> relentless. Uh, to me, he's a symbol of intuition because he's very instinctive. When I read a script, I try to look at all the events that propel the story. And for me, it was him walking into the classroom. And while the whole town of Split River believes that Maddie disappeared, he says, I have a hunch 
I have a, a little instinct in me that something's wrong. And they're like, what's wrong? He goes, I don't know. I don't know what. And so I, I just love those kinds of people who, who follow their intuition because mm-hmm. I think we all need those, those Simons. Uh, otherwise, I believe society would crumble if everyone accepted all the information that was given to them. We, we have to refuse. We have to question things. Right. And Nicole is kind of, you know, getting on board a little bit, but at first is resistant to that. Yeah, I would say um, not like a bullet, but she's a tough cookie. She's brave. She's doing things that probably other people weren't like having the hope alive and the strong belief that, no, she's out there. She is not dead. My friend is not dead. Stop saying Mm -hmm. that. Um, And just sort of trying to figure out what happened to her. And you'll see that throughout the season, like her just going out of her way, trying to make it untrue that she's gone. And I would also say that she's kind and artistic. And even with some of the mistakes that she may make, um, she had good intentions and has good intentions when she is doing and making these decisions. Well, and without getting too much into it, for those of us who haven't seen the uh, the first couple episodes at least, Christian, can you tell me a little bit about Simon and Maddie's relationship? Because it's clearly very special you know, as we move forward. Yeah. It is. I think that their relationship is, to me, the most moving thing about school spirits because Mm -hmm. they met so young. And the analogy that I use is, so they met in third grade in the sandbox, but uh, a lot of people in this age we live in are are very resistant against the dynamic of a male and a female being just friends. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of sneaky intentions, a lot of suspicion with whether or not you have feelings. I think they are truly twin flames that mm. they're, they're soulmates and uh i'll just quickly add that if they're not like each other they're very mm. dissimilar which is kind of surprising they don't dress the same they don't talk the same most of the things they they are interested in are not similar but they're so close and that's weird because if you go to a high school and you see two pe- friends they have the same shoes they dress like each other but they're very different i think that's the rare kind of relationship and in life where when if you meet young enough, you can grow into two different people and be just as close as if you're the same person. So their identity is different, but they're they're that close. I, I, I love that. Right. And well, we've got Nicole and Simon as our truth seekers. You know, we're rooting for them to find out the really detectives. what happened to Maddie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've got our detectives. What was that like for you two to kind of work together and, and as actors to try and find the truth? <laughs> I think um, it was really, really fun. If not, I feel like there was a lot of times that we had to like, you know, those sort of laughs that you're like, okay, hold on, like, shut up. They're about to, they're about to start rolling again. We need to get serious again. That happened a lot on, in our scenes. Um, but no, it was really great. It was great to watch him. He's very much like a, he's a, he's an actor's act, like very artistic. And it's really interesting walk, watching him work. And I, I remember taking a bunch of BTS on the monitor when he was doing all his series scenes. So it was very nice to watch and just a nice dynamic. Um, yeah. Very light when we did have those light scenes yeah. and fun. I am loving School Spirit so far. I am like dying to get, well, dying to get to the bottom <laughs> of the mystery. Um, but right off the bat, could you just both tell me a little bit about Xavier and, and Claire and what it was that drew both of you to your characters? Rainbow, if you want to go first. Yeah. Um, so I play Claire, uh, Claire Zoma. She is a popular Split River cheerleader and swim team captain. She's definitely really mysterious. She is not what you would imagine after watching the first couple of episodes. There's a lot of layers to her um, that will unfold as the series continues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Spencer? I play Xavier. Uh, he is Maddie Near's boyfriend, and I guess that kind of makes him public enemy number one and suspect <laughs> number one. Uh, he's a dude with a lot of like walls, and and I think Maddie was probably the only one he let those walls down for. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Well, I, it you know just from what I've seen so far, it does seem like Xavier and Claire may have some secrets that they are mm. keeping down deep. Can you tease me a little bit about the journey that uh, that fans are about to go on with both of them? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, what can we say? <laughs> it's, uh, it's complicated. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's a complicated relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, they, do we say it? They have a... They have... They have, <laughs> <laughs> they have a lot of... They have a lot of 
we have feelings for one another. Mm. And it's a very complicated situation. Um, yeah. As yeah, and it's going to lead them to some trouble, possibly. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and it's really fun to play around kind of with the afterlife and, and your characters that are on the living side. Mm-hmm. How is that for you as, as the actors who are having to play to people who are, quote unquote, not there? Oh, that's fun. Yeah, th- it was a, it was a fun, really fun uh thing i mean i mean i, I know uh, christian who plays simon got to do a lot of that mm-hmm. which i think lands really well in the show the yeah. idea of him just like talking to a wall and like yeah. it, how comedic that is to just be a passerby and see a guy just like having an argument with, with a with a bookcase mm-hmm. uh, but, uh, but i think as it goes on we get more and mm-hmm. more um kind of moments to, to have brushings with the dead and 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 try our best to not look at them and not it's hard (laughs) and not walk into them but just act normal and walk past and they're they're right there and staring at you and you just can't look at them yeah (laughs) well and it's such a fun and interesting tone to a show too because it it is very funny and also obviously a mystery there's a lot of dark stuff going on there too what is it for both of you that really appeals to you about the story and that you think people are really going to relate to um I think that all the characters are really relatable. I think they um, they have really real real stories. The the writing is so well done um, that they're they're multi dimensional characters. They're just they're not just your high school tropes. They mm-hmm. de- really debunk all the tropes that are through the centuries and also through other YA shows. Yeah, absolutely. And what about you, Spencer? Yeah, I think that um, what Megan and Nate Trinra, uh, the creators of this, did really well is is there's a lot of like present archetypes in the show, but they're all subverted almost instantly in, into these uh, just very yeah three dimensional people. Mm. Um, and I, I think that that's that's really cool. Uh, I, I love that. Yeah, even like with my guy Xavier, he uh, has two very very clear sides to him, and and he, it's very tough to get a read on him. Yeah, I have to say, you're both keeping me on on my toes so far. <laughs> I can't wait to see what happens. Uh, throughout the rest of a season. So School Spirits is super fun. I am really enjoying myself watching it. Uh, And Wally is like the best character. Tell me a little bit about him and what drew you to his character. Um, Wally is the the most fun character I've ever played. He has the the most comfortable wardrobe I've ever had. He he's just a puppy dog, you know, and he uh, I also realized this shooting the movie i love the 80s i love everything that came out of the 80s the movies especially the music i would listen to 80s music on my way to work pretty much every day to get me in the wally mindset um but he's just a kind-hearted guy and he just wants to have fun you know and that it's it's always really refreshing when you get to play a character who's gen- generally happy and wants to have a good time um because it really just puts you in a better mood like offset as well um and he's surrounded by amazing people and what more could you ask for yeah exactly and he gets to wear you know but he's got the sweats and the shorts you know style i will never take that for granted in my, like ever again like i uh <laughs> he gets to wear sweats all day and just it's I, it's a blessing that was a blessing and i i definitely uh, understood what a blessing it was yeah well, and Wally's kind of this legend of the school. He's got a very different high school experience than his fellow uh, afterlife uh, colleagues. How does yes. that affect his relationships with all of them? That's a good question. I mean, you know, Wally was the golden boy when he was alive. They they named the stadium after him. He obviously is somebody that people think of fondly at the school. Um, it's interesting because you never really get to see um, how Wally adjusts to the afterlife. You meet him when he's been dead for, you know, 40 years. Um, so he's pretty well adjusted. Um, and something that I love about Wally in the show is his sort of like unconventional friendships with these, these people that, uh, it's kind of impossible for those friendships to be because you have, you know, uh, a high schooler in the eighties with a high schooler in the nineties who just lived in a completely different time, the sixties. And they have these, this weird, like brother, sister relationship. And they, you know, but they're, they're, they're family, you know, and they help each other grow and they're there for each other. There's not really anybody else that's there. Tell me a little bit about the, uh, the, kind of dialogue between the afterlife support group, because I feel like those scenes must have been so much fun to film. I was hoping that on the first day we would be able to like do some improv and banter a little bit. Mm -hmm. And 
boy was i right we got to go off on tangents every single scene and do whatever and also um the director of episode one and two max wakeler he would shout stuff out at us and he'd be like just play with this just do just go on this tangent or whatever and that's like such a blessing as an actor to be able to explore i know it's kind of scary sometimes but i feel like when you have a good understanding of your character and uh, the relationships it's really fun and those scenes were my favorite to shoot uh, honestly Obviously, there's so many different things that we get to do on the show, but coming back to the afterlife support group, it's just refreshing. It's comfortable. Um, and there, it's so fun. Like it's it's like playing a game, honestly. It's like back and forth, like tossing a ball. It's really fun. And are we gonna get to dive into a little bit more of Wally's, you know, pre-afterlife life as the as the show goes on? Yeah, I can't, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say, but I will yeah. say you definitely take you take a deep dive into all of the dead characters' lives mm-hmm. and you learn a lot about them and you get to know them really personally, which I feel adds a lot to the show. Um, and there's also, you know, it something that is cool is it kind of plays into what decade they're from as well. Like the, these, like, I, I don't want to say not even stereotypes, but just these like uh, these ways of living you really dive into. And I think it's cool to have a show where you have people from all different times at the same age and it highlights the things that are different, but also highlights what we all universally go through as high schoolers. Um, but yeah, I had a really good time taking a, a deep dive into Wally's past life. And we ha- I had a lot of connections with him that I didn't really know I would have when I just auditioned for the character. School Spirits is a ton of fun. I am dying to know what happens at the end, if excuse the pun. But uh, <laughs> there's like a really interesting dynamic going on here, too, with it, both as the show and as the upcoming graphic novel. So can you tell me a little bit about working together to kind of set this tone and adapting it separately and, and together, kind of? Yes. Um, well, we it's kind of a strange path that the story took. We actually originally wrote it as a pilot script and sort of spent some time shopping it around. It didn't really go anywhere. And um, we decided to try and sell it as a graphic novel, which was really wonderful experience for us because we, as two people who kind of think of ourselves as TV writers, um, writing a graphic novel ended up being really similar. It's so visual and so rich and so much fun to to work with dialogue and be able to see how your artist takes that and and transforms it into these incredible images. So um, we we sort of have back done this backwards a little bit because the the graphic novel hasn't come out yet. But we we are really really pleased with the adaptation in that the big themes and the important parts of the story. Um, are so clear in both. We're really getting to take the heart of the graphic novel and, and and transform it into this series. Yeah, one of the best parts about adapting sort of graphic novel to TV is graphic novel, you know, there are restrictions. There's so much art that has to be created and we have an amazing artist, Maria Wynn, um, who's, who's working with us, but it takes time. And so you are really limited on how much story you can really tell. Yeah. With TV and eight hours of episodes, we really have the ability to dig into these characters, build out this world and see even more. So for us, it was just a treat. We got to make something and then expand on it. Yeah, absolutely. And how did that, uh, if at all, influence kind of the, the the graphics of the television show? Was there anything that you were working off of in reference to the graphic novel or was it just a whole new world? You know, what's funny is, is no, we never really shared the art with our uh, creative team on the TV show. But what is wild is that now when you sort of look at them, they don't feel dissimilar. So I think the spirit of what these things were kind of transcended both mediums in a, in a really interesting way. And I think a lot of people on the creative team, our directors, our writers, embrace the idea of the graphic novel. So even if it wasn't a direct sort of um, mm-hmm. taking it directly from those images, it's that feel of the graphic novel, that feel of of a beautiful illustration. It's yeah, very cinematic. Framing. They're both very cinematic. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, and tell me about the casting process because we have so much good up and coming talent uh, paired with some of these actors who we recognize from from many wonderful projects. I think that we were cognizant of wanting to find faces and people who were distinctive mm-hmm. and who were could hold them, you know, could hold their weight, obviously too, with the veterans who you just mentioned. <clears throat> For us it was really important that people felt distinctive, you know, and the idea of I've worked on many, several YA shows, and it's hard sometimes because, you know, the need for what the network may want and 
a certain look, a certain, and I think that we were given free reign in a way to really fill up this canvas with very um, particular great faces and people from different eras as well, which is inspiring, you know, that we get to figure out, okay, who really feels like she could have been in that era where he feels like he is in that. So um, I think for us, it was like, we looked for the best actors and we found them. Yeah, everyone does such an amazing job. And the show really plays with a lot of stereotypes and kind of subverts them at every turn. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, yeah. I mean, but there was a real goal with this show is that is that we wanted to sort of set up tropes that everyone understands and then deconstruct them. I think one of the big themes with this series is the idea that, like, we're all haunted by something, you know, no matter what it is. And there's a lot more going on under the surface than we all realize. Um, so we, we have an opportunity with this series and these amazing eight actors to really sort of set them up as one thing and slowly reveal that they're much more than that. There's a lot more complexity there. I mean, there was a breakfast club element that we all love to this. We're not going to lie. You know, we were all inspired by the John Hughes of it all. But I think we wanted to find a way to make that contemporary and also have the time. Breakfast Club is a two hour, it's two hours. I don't even know, yeah. maybe 90 minutes. But movies are two hours and we have eight hours to actually explore. And I love what you said, subvert, because that is what we're trying to do as well. Yeah, well, it's a wonderful show. I can't wait to see uh, how the mystery wraps up. You've been subverting my expectations. So thank you <laughs> so much for talking uh, with me today and taking the time. 